Thank you. We now move to our final paper speech of the night. And closing the case for the opposition tonight is Mr. Leonis Pausch. Leonis is a second year undergraduate reading history and politics at Homerton College. He won the right to speak through open audition. Leonis, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. Before I start the speech, I want to make two things crystal clear. I'm by no means a sufficient replacement for the speaker who was meant to be here tonight, which is Mr. Arsenit Yatsenyuk, who was the former Prime Minister of Ukraine. Uh, he was not here tonight out of understandable reasons because there was an energy shortage in Kiev and he couldn't join us virtually. And secondly, given to the recent cross-border incursions into Ukraine near Kharkiv, I think everyone in this debate can agree that the US and NATO could and should do, should do better to support the fight. Still, the general approach of support from the West is the right one these days. Slava Ukraine. February 24, 2022 was a day that dramatically changed the relationship between the West and Russia. The UK government here at home joined hands with many of our allies around the globe and we were faced with a choice on that day whether to turn a blind eye to atrocities committed by Russia or to step aside from well wishes and turn empty gestures of empathy into tangible and decisive action. I'm proud to say that across the West, the obvious answer and the most compelling answer and the correct answer was to pursue the latter option, unwavering support. When the time came to support our allies against a hegemon ready to ignore the principles of serenity, which is the foundational principle of international law, we did what was right and stood against the bully that is Russia. That, ladies and gentlemen, is something that we can all be proud of and the course of action that the opposition does not regret. The crux of the issue at this debate is whether or not Western allies have readily opposed Russia when it has mattered most within the boundaries of what the law permits and acted responsible to help protect the dignity of Ukraine while being cautious not to endanger our citizens here at home. We, the opposition, are of the opinion that we have given support when asked, helped when aid was most needed and conformed when the struggle was the most crucial boiling point. But we cannot begin to pat ourselves on the back based on what we do today without having a look at our actions in the past. What about the decade of prior approaches to West towards Russia and the Russian people? We hear the Western approach characterized by inconsistency, by hesitation, by fear to engage and sanction, and that there was, have been, should have been a harder line towards incursions in Chechnya, in Georgia, and in Ukraine. Now, whilst I can understand what my, one might think that, considering the current climate, I move to argue that although uh, the West must have made up, historically not been made the completely wrong, right decision at all times, um, we have still made the right decisions in the overall approach. A moment of clarity here might be beneficial in terms of explaining what regret actually means. Regret implies agency, replay, regret implies options. In Russian case, there was simply no real alternative. For context, it is crucial to highlight that for Russia, the West exists as an unmistakable threat to its neo-colonial and expansive imperial project. Scholars have... Yes? So on that point, um, we did have sanctions. We supported Ukraine in their fight. We sent over 38 billion pounds in um, investments there, both non-military and military. We, I think also no, not more sanctions would have helped. I mean, what if the alternative? More sanctions that would just incredibly increase the ontological insecurity uh, Russia already faced. And also, I think there was a hope in, in uh, Russia that, or from the West towards Russia, that there might be a regime change and it would have just left the country in disastrous economic circumstances, making grievances and the alternative to Putin even worse. I will move on. Uh, so scholars have consistently and famously remarked on just how much paranoia the West and the growing liberal international order caused for Mr. Putin. He himself argues that the West is not to blame 
uh, is to blame for the invasion of Ukraine, claiming NATO's enlargement made Russia insecure, forcing P Putin to lash out. The international relations scholar John Mersheimer provocatively argued in 2014 the Ukraine crisis is the Western fault. This narrative has gained traction um, from the 2000. 22 onwards. On this point, I think it's important also to, to be unmistakably clear. The coalition of countries in peaceful organisation to determine the combined safety of the international community is not a source of regret, neither is the access to safety sought after by Ukraine a plea which the West has to begun to engage with. To run when a bully comes to calling is the action of a weak um, but the strongest stand their ground motivated by the principle of engagement. Many who blame the Ukraine con uh, conflict on NATO overlooked the fact. Over the past 30 years, Moscow's stance on NATO has been fluctuating. In 2002, while in London, Putin, then acting Russian uh, president, even suggested that Ma Russia might join NATO. Why not? Why not? I do not rule out such possibility, he remarked. After 9-11 attacks, Putin helped the US establish military bases in uh, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. When NATO announced in 2002 expansion to include Estonia, Lithuania and Latvia, uh, he barely erected as well. The Ukraine, even in 2002, when Ukraine interacted with NATO, he was just saying, I'm absolutely convinced Ukraine will not shy away from the process of expanding. Interaction with NATO and the Western allies as a whole, at the end of the day, the decision is to be taken by NATO and Ukraine. If NATO was always a threat, why did Putin facilitate these bases and remain unbothered by NATO expansion in the early 2000s? The historical record does not support the idea that NATO alone is to blame for the Russian antagonism. Uh, instead, we should look, look somewhere else for answers um, regarding Putin's hostility towards Ukraine and its allies. Sorry, I'm already taking a point. So the question was still and is still how to deal with the aggressive, yes, terrible, insecure power. How to defend Western values while de-escalating the situation. The only serious answer was pre-2022, a two-track approach as championed by German Foreign Minister Steinmeier. There was a visible military measures and sanctions. Yes, one needs to penalise actions, but there was also efforts for cooperation. Looking at integration to the international order, Russia was not to be integrated in the core West, but kept in dialogue. They were part of the G8, they were part of Eurovision, but not of NATO and the North Atlantic Cooperation Council. They did not experience the uh, Marshall Plan, but they had uh, received support in the 1990s by the IMF. There was a balance act between allowing them opportunities to dialogue while acknowledging and respecting human rights and democracy. Since Russian invasion of Ukraine, Germany's politicians have been on an apologetic tour in the country relying their uh, Russian reliance on uh, energy. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz responded to the Russian government by declaring its Seiten vendor and finally shutting down Nord Stream 2. Critics of German policy now frequently decry, uh, no, sorry, simply deride it as mercantilism based on uh, former Chancellor Angela Merkel would have that apology very much. Yet, Hansstadt Wandel, the principle of economics can change politics in beneficial ways, deserves more respect than has been given due. Peace through commerce didn't prevent war in Ukraine, absolutely not, but that, was, that doesn't mean the theory and the general approach was invalid. Angel didn't think the war was impossible in 1914, but it was futile, it was illogical, it was uneconomical, even from the evader's perspective. If you lay your neighbours in ruin, uh, you also destroy your own suppliers and markets. As Mise put, if the tailor goes to war against the baker, he must henceforth bake his own bread. In willfully pursuing sanctions, we have to carry out the metaphor, bake our own bread. We have seen first time in this country the cost of standing up against Russia, despite the consequence from soaring energy costs to worsen the, uh, domestic inflation, the economic shocks experienced by the West. Sorry, um, not anymore. I, already, I think I got my minute now. Um, so, now while Schengen have won the Ukrainians the war, it has certainly increased the internal pressure on Mr. Putin and has slowed the viciousness of this assault. Some here now frequent motioned that sanctions may um, not be of great utility. A sanction regime generally is not a bad idea. The imposition of international sanctions on South Af Africa began economic pressures as saw the unraveling of apartheid. On the Russian case, uh, in the mid-1990s, the US convinced Moscow not to export a centrifuge enrichment to Iran by threatening sanctions. They didn't do it in the end. Similarly, under George W. Bush administrations, under the threat of sanctions, Russian arms exports to Iran uh, significantly declined from 201 billion mil uh, million pounds annually to 18 million pounds by 2007. Sanctions clearly work sometimes, even in Russia. And I also have to point out that one of the opposition, uh, proposition speakers said sanctions were too much. 
and the other one said sanctions were too little. So there's no real ground of uh, argument here that can be substantiated by the proposition. The West approach to Russia was not a mistake, to conclude now, but rather a part of a dedicated and sustained effort to defend the rights and dignity of sovereign nations across Europe, which were under attack. Any more sanctions, any significantly harder response would have been not of impact, particularly in hindsight of the effectiveness of further sanction in support of Ukraine nowadays. More sanctions would have just hit the population even harder, making it even tougher to transition away from Putin. History teaches us that economic integration and cooperation have always been effective in promoting stability and peace. Yes, I can, you can scrutinize the past and wish for stronger action in regards to Chechnya, Georgia and Ukraine. However, the West's strategy to engage Russia through economic means was based on the belief that interdependence would foster peace. Critics may now see this as naive, but it is crucial that actions must, must be both unfaltered to be sustainable. As we face current challenges, let us remember that the quest for peace must go through economic means and it is not futile, neither is it immediate, but rather it is an enduring strategy that will help us shape for a more stable world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Leonis. And with that, our debate tonight concludes. So a couple of short not notices from me before we go to the vote. On Sunday, um, we'll have a speaker event. So we'll have St. Levant, who will be addressing the chamber at 7 p.m. Um, on Monday, we'll have our women and non-binary debate on the motion, this house believes the internet has ruined sex. And then on Sundays and Tuesdays, um, there'll be free coffee and tea in the members' lounge as part of our new members' initiatives. Um, you can also still purchase tickets for our summer party, um, which will be on June 15th. And tickets are only £40 for members, so we do encourage you to buy them. Um, and last, but certainly not least, nominations for elections at the end of this term for standing positions served in Lent 2025 will open on the 27th of May and close at 6pm on June 3rd. So if you'd be interested in running for committee here at the Union, do check out your emails for that. But we now move to vote. So could the tellers please take their positions? So as you know, in this house, we vote with our feet. Eyes to the right, nose to the left, and abstentions right down the middle. The results will be announced in the bar afterwards. Um, they will also have free chips and special debate night cocktails. So do join us to continue the debate in the bar. Could we please end with one last round of applause for all those that contributed this evening? Good night and good luck.